This video will review research methods for the NBCLT. For the learning objectives, by the end of this video, you will demonstrate knowledge for common research terminologies, different levels of evidence, when each should be used, the different types of studies, quantitative versus qualitative, sampling methods, collecting and measuring data, interpreting a statistical test to determine the efficacy of the independent and dependent variable, and determine if an intervention is evidence-informed or not to use for your OT interventions. And I realize that this is not the most interesting or exciting topic for most of you, so I will try to provide a very high-level and concise review for this content. For more information on specific concepts, I recommend that you refer back to your lecture notes, textbooks, and study guides that you made for your course exams from OT School. And if you are only watching this from YouTube, I highly recommend that you enroll in my free NBCOT exam prep course to access and review the study guide and to quiz your knowledge of these concepts to reinforce your knowledge using different learning methods besides just watching a video. The link will be in the description. I'm Jeff, the OT Dude, and let's get functional. Before we go into the specific terminologies and concepts, I want to remind you to remember the ethics when conducting research. So the OT ethics that you know already also apply for research, such as autonomy of the research participant, beneficence, justice, and so on. An example of a good research practice is providing, say, full disclosure to the participants, minimizing their harm, such as triggers when interviewing participants or providing interventions, and protecting them from exploitation. You should also respect participants' right to privacy when handling their data and when publishing their results, say online or in a research article, based on how you originally designed the study and informed them in the first place and how you debriefed them. You will want to provide informed consent, and before research is conducted, it will often go through an IRB, right, or Institutional Review Board. This is called the IRB process for ethical research, and there are three common types for the kind of speed of it, so to speak. One, full review. Two, an expedited review. And three, exempt. So there is something now, like a trend maybe, that I've noticed of something called evidence-informed practice. Not evidence-based practice, but evidence-informed practice, EIB, which is different from what I was learning in OT school, where the focus was mainly, I just remember being on evidence-based practice. And we all know that it is often best to provide the most up-to-date and research-supported evidence. But ironically, I think some of the resources that we study from or use are outdated methods or even ineffective methods compared to the latest and greatest research. And I think just across all professions, there's kind of a lag, so to speak, between research and practice because it takes some time for practitioners to look into the research, for it to be accepted, you know, so on. But evidence-based practice consists of asking a question, such as a PICO question, P-I-C-O, or sometimes PCOT with a T at the end. P is for population, or the problem. I is for intervention. C for comparison. And O for outcome. This process involves searching for the evidence, evaluating and appraising it, integrating it, into a clinical evaluation and evaluating its effectiveness. And critics of EBP anyways argue that it is too restrictive for decision making for our clients. So then instead, evidence-informed practice seeks to include more evidence from a variety of sources to inform our practice by adding some of our own wisdom and common sense. Cool, right? So also using other sources such as case reports and expert opinion are more weighed, so to speak, in evidence-informed practice. So in other words, compared to evidence-based practice, evidence-informed practice also factors in different 
levels of evidence, all the way down to, say, the expert opinion. A term that embodies evidence-informed is finding a convergence, convergence in our evidence sources. And evidence-informed practice can also be considered more client-centered even compared to evidence-based research, which is more typically thought of as focused on the science of quantitative evidence, critics say. So then which is better, evidence-based practice or evidence-informed? Well, that's up to you to decide. I'm not really here to answer which is better. I think both, both of them have their place. And it depends on your setting. And it's really a individual case-by-case -case basis. So with this in mind, let's review the different levels of hierarchies of evidence. Systematic reviews and randomized controlled trials, RCT, are traditionally considered to be the highest levels of evidence. These levels of evidence also have the nomenclature level 1A and level 1B, level 2, and so on. Level 1 is the highest and covers meta-analysis, systematic reviews, and randomized controlled trials. On the other end of the spectrum for the lower levels of evidence is level 4, which includes, say, expert opinion. And this is not like saying that level 4 should be factored less when you're considering the evidence. It's just from a scientific standpoint, it's not as scientifically strong, so to speak. So imagine some situations then where some RCTs are not even conducted or published yet for, say, new diseases even, like when COVID-19 was first like a thing, like we really relied on the experience really and the insights that our first line healthcare providers have gained from working with these patients before the research was even published, right? And having some expert opinion, I would argue, is better than using nothing at all, at all. So, and to remember that level one, I know it's kind of opposite, is the highest level of evidence Imagine being in a library and the floors where you're conducting research. So on the ground floor, level one, is probably where you get the most foot traffic and visitors. So it's where the most important, best evidence is. But no one really goes all the way up to like level four where the books like gather dust and stuff. So that's way less in the scientific community. So how is evidence-based practice different than research? I'm not saying how EBP and evidence-informed is different. It's how is evidence-based practice and evidence-informed different than just research itself? Well, both evidence-based practice and research have similar steps in the process, but it's the action or actual doing of things that it comprises of that is different. In terms of similarities, both of them involve raising the question, identifying a problem, searching through the current literature, appraising the data and then coming to a conclusion. But one difference is that evidence-based practice can be thought of as more of an abbreviated approach to appraising and critiquing the research. Whereas the research itself, conducting a research, you can imagine like a full-on research study is more involved. It takes more time. Imagine yourself as an OT practitioner looking at new evidence-based practice. This should definitely take less steps than conducting a full research study. So that's basically the difference that I'm trying to highlight. And with the types of evidence besides clinical research, there's clinical expertise and also patients' needs and values. More broadly, research can be basic or can be applied. Basic research is driven by one's curiosity and one's knowledge. Instead, applied research, think of the application of something, is designed to really just solve a problem, such as helping humans and how they help them live better lives. You all know there's quantitative and qualitative research. Compared to qualitative research, quantitative research makes it more easy to apply statistical tests and generalize the results to a larger population. Most often, such as with randomized controlled trials, these are considered to be the gold standard. Experimental research involves the manipulation of independent variables and then the measurement of dependent variables. But qualitative research can also provide a lot of insight into the research or problem that is being studied. Many qualitative research studies are descriptive. 
One way to think of descriptive research is that it describes some characteristics of the population or phenomenon, but it does not necessarily answer questions about, say, how, when, or why. It addresses more of the what, like what is. Longitudinal study involves repeated observations of the variables over a period of time, such as even spanning several decades. The definition for longitudinal research contains the term observation in it. So a longitudinal study is a type of observational study. Cohort studies recruit and follow participants who share a common characteristic, such as a particular occupation or a demographic, similarly. During the period of the follow-up, some of the cohorts will be exposed to a specific characteristic. So then, by measuring outcomes over a period of time, it is then possible to explore the impact of this variable. I'm sure you all know what case studies are, and you likely have done a lot of these in your OT education, so I won't go over that. Expert opinion, like mentioned earlier, is pretty self-explanatory. Who would you consider to be influential, or who would you ask for expert opinion? An example is, say, Kiel Hoffner for MOHO. Outcomes research is related to healthcare, basically, where the study investigates health practices, such as the patient experience that they receive after being discharged, for example. Qualitative research has different types of studies that fall under this category, because it studies things like people, either individually or as a group or a more broader population. So then it makes sense that there's many ways to go about studying them. There's no real like one simple way to do it. And oftentimes this is done with observation in their natural setting. A phenomenological study studies the participants' experiences. For example, in my capstone, we conducted a phenomenological study of the experience of first time guide dog owners and their occupations and participations and their barriers to occupations and what they specifically experienced in their own environment and their own situation. Ethnographic studies study the characteristics of the group, such as their values and their beliefs. Think of the word ethnicity. A heuristic study involves the researcher actually experiencing the natural environment of the participants. It aims to understand the human experience and the meanings behind it. Think of the term like I am here for the heuristic part because of the participant being here or there to experience the participant's involvement. A quasi-experiment still uses an independent variable that is manipulated to determine its effect on a dependent variable, but it is less of the gold standard like a randomized controlled trial due to the researcher having less control and there's also no randomization. In contrast, a non-experimental study, like a completely non-experimental study, has no manipulation of the independent variable and there's no researcher control as well as no randomization because it's not possible. But even though there's like no manipulation of the variables, it doesn't mean that you can't study them, right? You just can't manipulate them. So researchers can still study its effects. A non-experimental study is also known as a correlational study because it can be used to study the potential relationship between two variables like correlation and causation. And then to get a little bit more deep into it, sub subtypes of non-experimental or correlational studies. They include retrospective correlational, which is the past, prospective correlational, which is the present, descriptive correlational, and predictive correlational. The measures of central tendency are mean, median, and mode. The measures of variability, think of the word variable, is the variability or the spread between the variables. These measures of variability include things like range, normal distribution, and a standard deviation. Range is pretty intuitive. It's the difference between the lowest and the highest scores. 
An example is say housing prices range from the lowest in one neighborhood to the highest in a more wealthy neighborhood. And so the range is from very, very low home prices to very, very high home prices. Standard deviation is defined as the determination of the variability of the scores or the difference from the mean. And for a normal distribution, think of it as a symmetrical, I can't do it with my hands, bell curve, bell curve that indicates the distribution of scores evenly, like symmetrical. Now let's review the levels of measurement, nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio. Examples of nominal are gender and ethnicity as they are classifications. Ordinal, they can it as rankings such as first, second, and third, like order ranking. Interval allows for more sensitivity between the numbers such as temperatures in Celsius, SAT scores, or credit scores. Ratio is like interval, but it has a zero that's defined. So if you think of temperatures, zero Kelvin is an example of the ratio. However, Fahrenheit, we think of it as 32 for freezing, right? So this is interval, but not ratio. A hypothesis is a declarative statement that predicts the relationship between the variables, such as in experimental research. A null hypothesis, N-U-L-L, declares that nothing will happen. Or in other words, there is no relationship between the two variables. Conversely, if you reject a null hypothesis, then this means that there is a relationship between the variables and it is not due to, say, pure random luck or due to chance. And hypothesis can also be directional or non-directional. Put simply, a directional hypothesis predicts that the hypothesis will go a certain way, which way the hypothesis will go. In contrast, non-directional, kind of intuitive based on the phrase, means that the hypothesis kind of has no idea where the outcome will go. The independent variable is a variable that can be manipulated. The dependent variable is the outcome variable that depends on the independent variable. Another term to know besides independent and dependent variables is covariation. Covariation is how much two variables vary together. In other words, covariance measures the direction of the relationship between the two variables. A similar term to covariation is correlation. So then what's the difference? Covariation, correlation. Both are used to understand the relationship between the variables. However, covariance indicates the direction of the relationship between the variables, whereas correlation measures both the strength and the direction of the relationship. You probably know already correlation from the correlation coefficient, which is abbreviated with the letter R, and R can be negative or positive, right? A positive correlation of R is from zero to leading up to a positive one and a negative correlation is from zero to negative one. A correlation that is equal to zero means that there is no correlation at all. Other terms used for correlation are strong, such as strong correlation, but this is more subjective, but it technically has a value that is closer to one, such as a value of 0.9, which is very close to one, whereas a non-strong or weak correlation, say, is equal to something about like point one, which is closer to zero, as there is no correlation. Now let's review type one and type two errors. A type one error means that you reject the null hypothesis when it is true. A type two error accepts the null hypothesis when it is false. Another way, which is easier for me to think of a type one versus type two, are false positive. A type one error is a false positive, such as on a COVID test. The test says that you have COVID when you don't. A type 2 error is a false negative, and so the test says that you don't have COVID when you actually do have COVID. All of these terms and concepts so far that we have reviewed 
help to build a foundation for you to critique and evaluate evidence on the NBCOT exam. I think that the most important part of this entire video really, especially for research methods, is what you would most likely be tested on also is the outcome and reading the outcomes and interpreting the outcomes of a test, say based on p-value. I won't go into the other tests as there are many that are kind of beyond the scope of this video, such as ANOVA, chi-square, Pearson's correlation, and so on. I'll try to make a separate video on these tests alone. But I think that the most important one, especially that I see in the research all the time, and the one that you should probably know pretty well, is how to interpret p-values. Remember that the null means nothing and that there is no effect. If the null hypothesis is true, then there is no relationship between the two variables. What the p-value then tells you is that if the research is statistically significant or if it's just really due to statistics or due to like pure luck or chance. The number that is usually used to indicate the significance is 0.05, either less than it or greater than it. So if you see a p-value that is less than 0.05, then the study is statistically significant. A p-value less than 0.05 indicates strong evidence against a null hypothesis. In other words, there is a less than 5% chance that the null is correct due to just results being read. So then, therefore, we accept the alternative hypothesis, the more exciting one, that there is a relationship between the two variables, say the dependent and independent variables. Conversely, a p-value that is greater than 0.05 is not statistically significant and indicates strong evidence for the null hypothesis due to the chance and there is no relationship between the two variables. So then we reject the alternative hypothesis. So now that you know how to interpret p-values, you should be pretty good, I think, on the NBCOT exam for demonstrating this section for knowledge of how to evaluate the research to use it or not in your interventions when doing the OT practice part. And if you are a little rusty on other concepts that I didn't cover in this video, such as validity, reliability, and things like that, I actually made some videos on these topics as well. You can watch them all by enrolling in the free NBCOT exam prep course and then looking in the research methods section and there will be videos posted for you to watch as well. Thanks for watching and good luck studying this. Hope this video helps.